My name is Sam, and I have arguably one of the best jobs in the hospital. I'm just curious if anyone has heard of what a child life specialist is. Okay, great. Um, as a child life specialist, my mission is to make the hospital experience a little bit easier for our young patients. Our goal is to reduce fear and stress by providing interventions that help children understand why they are in the hospital and what's going to happen to them. We also incorporate therapeutic play to help make their stay a little bit more enjoyable. To become a child life specialist, we earn a master's degree with a strong emphasis in human growth and development. Um, our coursework covers areas such as development, family systems, play, death and dying, and research. Um, and then we also incorporate a clinical internship to gain hands-on experience and then have to pass a certification exam. Uh, so what exactly do we do? Uh, we educate about diseases and treatments to ensure our patients understand their reasons for being in the hospital. We introduce coping strategies to help reduce their anxiety and enhance their cooperation with the healthcare team. And during medical procedures, we offer support and distraction to help them get through the experience more comfortably. Beyond that, we offer opportunities for play and expressive activities to encourage normal development and bring a sense of fun and normalcy into the hospital. We also facilitate conversations with siblings to aid in their coping. And additionally, we promote family-centered care by providing information, advocacy, and support uh, to families of our pediatric patients. Overall, our job is just to ensure that the emotional and developmental needs of patients are being met even when they're in the hospital. As you are all aware, CF is a chronic disease that requires ongoing management. So here I have highlighted the unique challenges faced by children with CF including frequent lung infections and difficulty breathing. You are all very well versed with the common symptoms and the medical treatments. Today, I wanna to focus on the psychological and emotional impact, as well as the developmental considerations of the disease, because it's crucial that we as providers address a patient's physical and emotional health when developing treatment plans. There can be many causes of medical trauma um, in pediatric cystic fibrosis patients. So there's the repeated and invasive medical procedures, the needle sticks, the blood draws, the pick placements, the port accesses, um, which contribute to a child's fear and trauma. Things like daily chest treatments can also be physically uncomfortable and invasive. There's an emotional impact too of being separated from family and missing normal activities. So children with CF may, may face significant disruptions to their daily routines due to the frequent hospitalization visits. This can impact their school attendance and participation in activities, le leading to missed educational opportunities. Additionally, to avoid infections, they often need to limit their interactions with peers, resulting in feel feelings of isolation and difficulty maintaining friendships. These disruptions can negatively affect their emotional well being and development. In my experience, there is also a level of anxiety that children feel due to the anticipation of pain and the uncertainty about their health. There can be anxiety about upcoming procedures and treatments and fear of disease progression and potential complications. The chronic nature of CF with its ongoing treatments and frequent medical appointments can create a never-ending cycle of stress and uncertainty that can significantly wear on a child's emotional well-being and mental health. For our younger CF patients, so our infants, our toddlers, our preschoolers, we also need to be mindful of the sensory and psychological challenges of the hospital environment and the feeling of loss of control. So in the hospital, for example, there's a ton of bright lights, there's new people, there's loud noises, there's unfamiliar smells, there's people touching your body. Um, the child also has limited autonomy um, and decision making in a medical setting. Here are some of the ways um, various medical trauma can manifest and its impact on a children's overall well-being. Behavioral changes like withdrawal and aggression can be signs of underlying trauma and frustration and fatigue from managing the illness. There are also psychological effects to be aware of. 
So studies have found that children and adolescents with cystic fibrosis, as well as their caregivers, are more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression compared to the general population. Specifically, these mental health issues occur two to three times more frequently in people with CF and their caregivers. This suggests that having CF or caring for someone with CF significantly increases the risk of experiencing anxiety and depression. In my work, patients have verbalized that the constant medical treatments, the frequent hospital visits, uncertainty around their condition, and fear of medical procedures can feel overwhelming and lead to significant stress and anxiety. Medical trauma can also impact a child's willingness to adhere to treatment plans, potentially, wor potentially worsening their health outcomes. So you might see avoidance or noncompliance. <clears throat> There's a developmental impact too. So developmentally, patients with CF are facing unique challenges. There's those, these frequent hospitalizations, which can delay the achievement of developmental milestones. <clears throat> The stress and fatigue associated with CF can make it difficult for them to concentrate and perform academically. And due to frequent hospitalizations and the need to avoid infections, children with CF might feel isolated from their peers. This isolation can impact their social development and lead to feelings of loneliness. Physical symptoms of CF, such as stunted growth and clubbing of fingers, can affect a child's body image and self-esteem. Additionally, the visible medical equipment and treatments can make them feel different from their peers. Family dynamics as well. So the impact of CF extends to family dyna dynamics. Siblings may feel neglected due to the attention given to the child with CF, leading to rivalry and other family tensions. As children with CF grow older, they face unique challenges in planning for their future, including concerns about independence, career choices, family planning, life expectancy. Understanding the profound impact that medical trauma can have on our pediatric patients, it's crucial that we explore the effective strategies to alleviate these challenges. One of the most effective approaches involves preparation and education, which are key components of the child life specialist's role. Let's now delve into how these interventions can make a significant difference in the lives of these young patients. Using age-appropriate language to help children understand their condition and treatment and to prepare for medical procedures can reduce anxiety and fear, ultimately making the experience less traumatic for patients, for families, and for staff. Age-appropriate education might look like incorporating books, diagrams, or videos to help children visualize and understand their disease and treatment, using dolls and stuffed animals to help explain procedures to children, such as receiving a pick line, getting a feeding tube placed, or receiving anesthesia, and using medical play and mock equipment to familiarize a patient with medical processes in a non-threatening way, like a CT scan. This is the fun part. <laughs> While preparation and education are crucial and so important, um, therapeutic play also plays a vital role in helping children process their experiences and develop coping skills. So let's look at how structured play activities could make a difference. In an effort to encourage a patient to express her emotions and process her hospital experiences, I took a large piece of butcher paper, like nothing fancy, um, and attached it to this, the patient's door. Um, and then with a big black marker, I asked her to make a list of all the things that she finds difficult about her lung disease. Um, she wrote breathing, missing school, mucus, taking medicine every day, anesthesia, being away from friends, being stuck in my hospital room. And then it was time to have fun. So we loaded a bunch of empty syringes with like really bright colored paint. <laughs> um, and then we just took aim at all of her distresses. Um, and then soon all of her stresses were buried in globs of, of paint. <laughs> um, and then for a teen, someone a little bit older, 
um, employing artistic of interventions can also be well received. So I've done um, an anxiety or a worry tree where the patient drew a tree and then each leaf represented a different stressor or source of anxiety. There was one particular case where the teen showcased her art um, in her hospital room um, so that the larger medical team was able to view her stressors. This was someone who is otherwise very reserved and not very forthcoming with how she was feeling with her emotions, with her responses to hospitalization, um, but she found it a lot easier to share this part of herself through art. In addition to therapeutic play, um, providing consistent emotional support is key to helping children and their families navigate the challenges of CF. So here I'm gonna discuss uh, strategies for emotional support that can build resilience and overall improve their well-being. So there's individual support. Um, this happens during one-on-one -on -one visits where patients have the opportunity to process their experiences and address their fears and concerns. Um, and then through the collaborate care model approach, specialists like myself can then advocate for the child's emotional and psychological needs. So anything that we've discussed in our visits um, by bringing awareness to their described emotions um, in larger settings, like in rounds and in care conferences. Um, coping mechanisms. So we teach we teach how to better cope with challenges. Um, we teach techniques such as deep breathing and guided imagery. Um, and then we use distraction techniques as well. Um, so that can look like using VR um, to divert attention during stressful times. Sometimes that's just an iPad. Sometimes that's a song on repeat. <laughs> um, it's what the patient chooses. And then parent education. So another big part of our job is providing parents with the tools to support their child emotionally. So teaching children how to talk to their child about their condition, educating parents on developmentally appropriate responses to hospitalization. So what is normal and maybe what is worrisome? Um, and then how to identify signs of anxiety or emotional distress and then how to create a supportive home environment. So maintaining routines and providing comfort items. And then family involvement. So encouraging the parents and the, and the siblings to participate in patient's care, their hospitalization and play. So inviting parents, inviting siblings, inviting aunts, cousins, whomever is there um, to participate so that the whole family is engaging in play. And then building resist resilience. Um, encouraging and praising children for their bravery and cooperation, and then helping children feel in control um, by involving them in the decision-making process, involving them in those medical care conversations. And while individual support, um, emotional support is important, the role of the family in the child's care journey cannot be overstated. So integrating the family into the care process not only provides emotional support, but enhances the overall treatment experience. And this brings us to the concept of family-centered care. The key principles that underpin family-centered care include respecting the family's knowledge, the value, beliefs, and cultural backgrounds, and providing comprehensive and timely information to families and encouraging collaboration and participation. So how do we do this? Um, family meetings, care conferences, so regularly scheduled meetings to discuss the child's care plan and their progress. Um, this ensures that both the patient and the child's voice is heard in planning. Also providing access to support services, including social workers, psychologists, um, and then creating policies that accommodate family needs. So sometimes that looks like flexible visiting hours um, and then family presence during procedures. By involving the families and the caregivers in the care process, you get improved outcomes and enhanced emotional support for the child. Throughout this presentation, we've explored the profound impact that medical trauma can have on CF patients. We discussed the various symptoms and effects of medical trauma, which can significantly affect a child's emotional and physical well-being. We also covered effective intervention techniques such as preparation and education, therapeutic play, 
and emotional support, which are essential in mitigating the negative effects. Lastly, we highlighted the importance of family-centered care, emphasizing that involving the family in the care process is crucial for providing comprehensive and compassionate care. Also, I hope that everybody will integrate child life services into their pediatric CF care plans. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Kate Yablonski. I'm one of the adult CF social workers at Stanford, and I also facilitate uh, three support groups for CFRI. Uh, medical trauma is a topic that's very close to my heart um, because I've had my own very significant experience with secondary slash vicarious trauma through my previous role as a pediatric oncology social worker, which I mentioned briefly last night. So I've had to spend a lot of time thinking about this and figuring out how to heal myself. So when Siri asked me to speak and Siri didn't know about my history with this, so it felt um, felt like destiny. So I had to say yes, even though I really don't like public speaking, it just felt like it was meant to be. So I'm grateful for the opportunity to share some of what I learned on my own personal journey and my professional journey to heal myself and um, share that with the people that I work with. So uh, I do want to just offer a trigger warning because anytime we're talking about trauma, um, and I'll talk about this more later, the way trauma works in the body, you can get surprised by things that might um, trigger you or uh, be upsetting. You might not see it coming. So I encourage any and all of you to take care of yourselves during this presentation. If something hits you sideways and you need to walk out, take a break, it's not going to hurt my feelings. Just do what you need to do. Okay. So whenever um, we're talking about trauma, I think it's helpful to sort of touch down on PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. It's a framework that's helpful in framing how people experience trauma of many kinds. So up on the slide, there's just a summary of the DSM criteria for PTSD, which is, you know, after exposure to a traumatic event, you can experience a combination of symptoms like flashbacks, nightmares, avoidance of triggers, hypervigilance, numbing, exaggerated startle response, et cetera. So not everyone who's impacted by traumatic event is going to develop the clinical criteria for PTSD, but it doesn't mean that you're not experiencing symptoms and you might still benefit from help and support that it has a trauma focus. So I also want to talk about medical traumatic stress, which is not a DSM diagnosis in and of itself, but is being talked about more these days as a distinct experience of trauma. Um, so medical traumatic stress, I mean, Sam already covered it, but it, you know you know what I'm talking about. You all personally know what I'm talking about. So it's the kinds of trauma responses you have to specifically medical experiences, like frightening treatment experiences, pain, you know, that kind of thing. The, the symptoms are the same as PTSD. So it might feel redundant, but I think it's important to talk about it as a dis distinct experience because it has implications for people's ability to do their um, treatment regimen. And it does, it's associated with reduced quality of life. So, so, you know, in the general population, in, in terms of people that experience a trauma, only about um, like, you know, 15 to 24% of people who, ex who experience trauma of any kind develop PTSD. And um, the, it's similar, the numbers are similar in CF. So there are some studies out there about medical traumatic stress in CF specifically, and uh, but not as many. So most of the research in this area is done with cancer and heart disease because there's just way more people that have those things. But a lot of what we can learn from that science can be extrapolated to CF and other chronic illnesses. So if you look at um, survivors of life-threatening medical events, the numbers are similar to general trauma. About 12 to 25% of those people will experience clinical PTSD. But then the really, really interesting thing that I want to put a fine point on is parents of children who watch their children go through life-threatening medical events, 20 to 30% of those parents will develop PTSD. It's higher. And it, that really doesn't surprise me at all. Um, you know, from my time in pediatrics, there wasn't a parent that I worked with that wouldn't have switched places with their kid and want, and felt the pain instead of their child. I don't think there's anything in the world worse than watching your child suffer. And so it's not surprising that it's actually more traumatizing sometimes for the parents than for the kids. And then there's a really good Brazilian study that was specific to uh, medical traumatic stress and CF. And they were looking at the percentage of people with CF that developed PTSD symptoms. And the range that they found was about 7 to 20%. And they used a range of like 
partial PTSD to full PTSD. So they were sort of taking into account, even if you don't meet the clinical criteria for PTSD, you are experiencing some of these symptoms. So another thing that I think is really important to understand uh, and is relevant to our community is that people with a history of any kind of trauma, medical or otherwise, are at higher risk of experiencing medical care as traumatic. So combat veterans, sexual assault survivors, you know, uh, uh, any of any kind of trauma, domestic violence, if you've experienced any of those things in your life, you are more likely to experience medical care as traumatic. Just like a very straightforward example, a sexual assault survivor having to come in for a routine pelvic exam, that's going to feel very traumatic for them. So, you know, we, we know that people with CF experience medical trauma, but we also have people with CF that have other kinds of trauma and then are having to interact with the medical environment quite often. So I think that we owe a big debt of gratitude to the military community because they really paved the way in terms of understanding trauma. And um, interestingly, there are way more survivors of medical events than combat veterans. So they did pave the way, but there's more people walking around in the world that have survived this kind of trauma that have survived combat trauma. So there's a lot of similarities and differences. And some of the important distinctions, if you think about the experience of trauma, like if you're you know, in a combat zone versus you have CF, the source of the threat is internal versus external. There's the threat is inside your body. And when you think about the re-experiencing symptoms, like the flashbacks and the, the fear and the avoidance, it can be more focused on, you know, worsening of your disease, functional decline, things that are actually real risks. They're not, you know, in your head, you know, that's, that you might, um, something that isn't realistic that can often be worked on in therapy. These, uh, and then th there was a quote from one of these studies quoted down at the bottom of the slide that I thought was really powerful and important that medical traumas are rarely discrete events with a defined endpoint. It just goes on and on and on. And so that is really important to think about that it's not, it's never over. So this is something that we have to continually deal with. And then if you think about what we all have in common, it is really interesting that no matter what kind of trauma you experience, the symptoms are the same across the board. And what really underlies all of that, the unifying thread is really a fear of mortality. So in terms of what's specific to people with CF, I mean, none. Of, I don't think much, much of this is going to surprise any of you. This is not a comprehensive list, but just some of the things that people with CF and their families might experience as traumatic. And Sam covered a lot of these already. Um, diagnosis I put first because no matter when you get diagnosed, whether you're the parent of an infant somewhere in the middle or as an adult, it's a huge life altering event that can be very traumatic. Um, then there's the stuff that's more straightforward, like, you know, being in the hospital, needle pokes, like Sam talked about, scary procedures. Hemoptysis is like the classic. It's like the one that people from outside the community can understand as really scary. There's visual blood, coughing up blood is scary. Watching someone you love cough up blood is scary. Um, anything having to do with ICU, lung transplant, intubation, you know, I remember when I was a young social worker and learned about the phenomenon of ICU psychosis, that just being in an ICU can cause psychotic symptoms. I mean, that says something, right, that um, and someone with no previous history of any psychotic issues, just being in the ICU with the never changing light and the beeping and intubation and sedation, it can literally drive you crazy. I mean, so that's, it's very traumatic. And, you know, I had a patient um, talk to me about mucomist. Like it was so horrible that when she gets near it, she has like a physical and physiological reaction. She like cannot be near it. And something like an enema, which like for a nurse, not a big deal, but if that is, uh, if you get a CF enema in the hospital and it's not done with like care and sensitivity and dignity, that can be very traumatic also. And then there's the the areas that are less obvious, but also very traumatic and in some ways more, which is like discrimination in the healthcare system. So I have so many patients that are people of color that have like a trauma reaction when they come in to seek medical care because they have experience after experience of not being believed, you know, being treated poorly in the medical system. Our late diagnosis population spent years not being believed, being told that all these things are in their head. Um, it really impacts your ability to trust yourself and trust the medical system. That can be experienced as incredibly traumatic. And, you know, the secondary trauma of being in a healthcare setting, being in the CF community, 
I was talking to a special person last night who was sharing just the um, amount of loss she's experienced. Like if you're someone in the CF community and you've really connected to it, you've lost a lot of people that you love. And that compounding grief over time um, is very significant. So there's a really, really good study that I highly recommend. Um, it's one of the few studies that's specific to medical traumatic stress and CF. It was done by our colleagues at UCSF and Kentucky Children's. And um, they interviewed people with CF who experienced medical traumatic stress. And they found these three overarching themes, which I think really covers it. It really covers what I was saying before that like, yes, there's the category of the perceived threat of bodily harm, right? The threat to your life, the threat to your body, pain and suffering. Um, but these other two categories are also really important and also traumatizing and really scary. So the loss of agency, the feelings of disempowerment. So there's so many different areas that people can feel a loss of control that can be traumatizing. You know, during a medical encounter, not having any control over the trajectory of your illness. And really this one is so, this last one is so underestimated. Loss of control within a system. So many CF centers are in big academic medical environments, and those are big bureaucracies. And um, you know, the, those kinds of big bureaucracies can be very dehumanizing for patients and for providers. And you know, working in one of those systems, it's you very you very often feel helpless. And something like insurance denials, like having to fight with these like basic basically robots on the phone with insurance companies about like your authorization, access to these life-saving medications over and over throughout your life, it's incredibly disempowering and can be very traumatic. And then the last one, you know, we've been talking about a lot more in the Trikafta era, but I think has always been there that these triggered shifts in identity throughout your life shifting from look, seeing yourself as a well person to a sick person and back and forth and back and forth um, is really like really difficult psychologically. And um, either, even if like, so we saw this a lot, we're still seeing this like after Trikafta, people having like a lot of like existential crisis about, I never thought I would live this long and now how do I see myself and what do I do next? And then maybe people that were doing well and then something changes and now they have to think, am I, am I now a sick person? Do I not have the life that I thought I would have? Those kinds of psychological lifts can really take a toll. And I think it's really, really important to point out that this kind of trauma is just not really um, acknowledged by our culture. Um, it's sort of like, this is how it is, right? It, I mean, if for people with CF, you have to interact with the medical system so much, it's practically impossible to get through your life without ever having negative interactions because there's you're just interacting with so many different people. It's just like a probability thing, you know? And there's just this idea like, this is how it is. And I've had so many people with CF say, well, we just have to deal with it, you know? And, you know, there's a bigger conversation to be had about changing the healthcare system that I have, anyway, you know, but um, with the system that we have, just because we know it happens, it doesn't mean it isn't trauma and it still matters. So if you are concerned about yourself or someone you love that you might be, you know, suffering from the effects of medical trauma, these are some things to look for. And I just want to emphasize, it's not any one of these things. Um, it's really a combination. And really what we're looking at is, is this really impacting your ability to function in your life? So, you know, I, I think a lot of this stuff is going to be familiar to you guys, but anyway, intrusive thoughts, um, avoidance. So for example, avoidance, uh, I have a couple patients that um, get debilitating anxiety before their PFTs. And, you know, they're pretty stable, but they've both had experiences where they got a bad PFT, they had to go into the hospital, untold number of terrible things happened. And, you know, now even when that, even now that they're stable, when they come in, they have this like physical reaction and they don't want to get their PFT, even though, and from the outside, you're like, well, you're not sick. What are you worried about? That's a trauma reaction. So, you know, things like difficulty sleeping, um, irritability. So I, I, I want to mention germophobia because obviously in our community, there is a, a totally appropriate level of germophobia. So, you know, and so we're not talking about like the normal, you know, we must protect ourselves thing. It's more like beyond a reasonable level where it's really affecting your ability to function in your life. You know, hypervigilance, symptom panic, like you, you get a symptom that is probably relatively routine and it sends you into the worst case scenario immediately, things like that. Survivor's guilt, which I think um, 
at least in the Hemonk world, maybe always in CF was more for like parents and siblings. But now people with CF, you know, with access to trichafta when other people don't don't have it, there, there's a lot of survivor's guilt there. So there was a quote from one of these articles that I really, really like that I think really sums it up, which is that your nervous system does not have a concept of time. Your body doesn't care how long ago it happened. So that's that's a really important thing to keep in mind when we're thinking about how we get better. So one of the things that I sort of learned the hard way um, is that you know trauma is unique sort of in the things we experience with our mental health because it's an emotional experience, but it's also really a physical experience. We experience trauma in our bodies, and a lot of times it's not accessible to us verbally, and we're not even aware of what we're holding on to. So um, I want to recommend a book that you guys have probably heard of, The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk, who is a psychiatrist. Um, it goes into a lot of fascinating um, science with brain scans about how trauma manifests in the body through physical symptoms and brain chemistry. I will say it's a very clinical book. It's written for providers. It's not written for the lay population. So it is pretty dense. It's I wouldn't say it's like a fun read, but it is really interesting. Um, and I will give you a trigger warning. There are some really difficult trauma stories in there. So just proceed with caution. But it it really, when I read it, it really helped explain to me what I, my patients, and a lot of my coworker friends had experienced. Like, I, for example, I had a coworker that developed this mass in her neck and got it all worked up. And like, fast forward to the end, diagnosis was like stress tumor. She was so stressed out. She had developed this like inflammation in her neck. I had another friend who had major GI issues. And as soon as she left the job, they resolved. And I'll share a quick personal story of my own. So I remember I was, this was when I was in Hemonk and I went up to see one of my patients. She was the same age as my daughter. She was in the ICU, super sick. And she was wearing a shirt from Target that my daughter had. I can still see it. It was gray and black stripes with this big pink bow. And she was wearing it. She had this really distended belly so that the shirt didn't even cover her belly. And there was something about like seeing this really sick child in a shirt that my child wears. And, you know, I stuffed it away and I kept going. And then the next day I dropped my daughter off at daycare and I had a full on panic attack, you know, and I wasn't aware, I wasn't thinking about it anymore. And it just hit me, you know, out of nowhere. And so your body reacts at a subconscious level. And this, these experiences of trauma actually impact the structure of our brains. So for example, for children that are witnesses of chronic domestic violence, when you scan their brains, it actually has changed their brain structure. And as adults, their brains are more likely to go into fight or flight immediately. So we know that these experiences impact us physically and emotionally, and the treatment needs to take that into account. So, you know, when I was trying to think about how I was going to get better, the idea of like sitting down with my therapist and just talking about it, I was like, where would I even start? I don't know where to begin. I don't know how to start. You know, it's just not, it's not like it's right there ready to talk about. So um, we are going to, I'm, I'm going to share. So how, so how do we heal? These are some places to start. It's not a comprehensive list. They are my favorites. Um, and it just gives us a starting point and I'll sort of review each one briefly. How am I doing on time? <laughs> Zero minutes, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'll, I'm gonna go through this quickly. I'm gonna go through this quickly. But basically the um, all of the concepts behind these kinds of therapies are, are different ways of changing your relationship to your traumatic memories. And they just come at it in different ways. The, the first one is my favorite, which is EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, uses bilateral stimulation and um, with all these different techniques to um, basically change your relationship to your memories. I'm going to speed through. So I'm not an EMDR practitioner. I've never been that good at explaining it. So I included this slide, which is a PowerPoint. No, no, I'm not going to read it. But I know these slides are going to be available. So I wanted it to be preserved. This is from EMDR International. And um, I feel like it, it, if you guys can sort of read it later, maybe online, but it gives you a good idea of what is involved with EMDR. And it, it's very evidence-based. Like EMDR really works and I think can be really, really helpful. And basically the concept is decreasing your body and brain's immediate reaction of going into fight or flight. So I'm, I'm actually going to speed through. I gave sort of an example of each um, kind of therapy, but I'm just going to speed through because I know we're short on time and everyone wants to hear Luann. So... <laughs> This I had to include, so it's a little bit of a side note, but there's this really interesting study 
from the Journal of Psychiatry in Neurosci uh, Neuroscience. It was done in males with combat-related PTSD, but there was one group that did EMDR, one group that did EMDR and played Tetris, and the guys that played Tetris had better reduction in their symptoms. So it's I don't really get it. I mean, for the doctors in the room, you can read the article because they also had an increased hippocampal volume, which I don't really know why that matters, but they were really happy about it. And so, but this goes... <laughs> This goes into the body body keeps the score stuff about there's there, there's something happening in our brains that we need to sort of come at it from a couple different angles. And this article is in my reference list if you want to read it. It's really cool. We'll skip through this. So cognitive processing therapy is a trauma-focused form of CBT. So don't worry, it's going to be... <laughs> Um, so it's, uh, it's, it's cognitive behavioral therapy, but focused on trauma. You know, the idea is identifying your automatic thoughts, changing your relationship to those thoughts. If you're interested in learning more about this, there's a really great, um, podcast episode of this American life called 10 sessions. It's episode 682. I actually looked it up in case anyone wants to listen to it. And it's, um, a sexual assault victim who talks to Ira about her experience and then her experience doing CBT. And it is fascinating. It really gives you an idea of what that therapy is like. An example, I'm just going to speed through this. And then the narrative exposure therapy. So uh, this is a trauma-focused version of narrative therapy. It was a beautiful modality that is similar to trauma narrative reprocessing, which they talk about in Body Keeps the Score. The whole idea is that you frame your life around storytelling. And if your storytelling is around a trauma, you're going to have a lot of distress. So it helps you basically rewrite your story with the goal of healing and resilience speed through the example. It's too small to see anyway. Finally, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the emerging research on psychedelic assisted therapies for trauma. So I just want, have to have a disclaimer. This, this science is really new and um, I don't think anything is out there on the market yet. So if you ask your CF providers, you're, it's not going to, it's too soon to get a full endorsement from them that it's okay for you to do this. But you know, I have a feeling that down the line, five, 10 years down the line, some of this stuff is going to be more available in the mainstream. So just very briefly, MDMA, uh, street name, ecstasy, or Molly. There's a, there was a clinical trial at UCSF last year that showed really good results. They're looking for FDA approval next year. Vander Kolk is an author on that study. There's a great New York Times article on that study if you want to look for it and you can get through the paywall, which I cannot. Um, and then the psilocybin, magic mushrooms, there's some really interesting studies. There's more than what I've listed here, but um, particularly the one at NYU on terminally ill cancer patients, one dose of psilocybin, and they had um, relief from distress that lasted more than six months for 80% of the patients. So that's really interesting. And then ketamine, which is different because it is an FDA approved drug, but it's an anesthetic and, you know, um, used recreationally, illegally, you know, as special K, a party drug, because it has a hallucinogenic properties. But there's a lot of work being done. Um, I quoted this study, Dueck, but there's a lot more. Um, it seems to have some potential in trauma. And um, they did a study last year that had really promising fi findings about its ability to help people change their relationship to their traumatic memories. So you can see the similarities between the therapy and even these sort of psychedelic therapies. The whole goal is to change your brain's relationship to your memories. So it's great that all this stuff is out there, but how do we access it? You know, that's always the problem is how do you get access to these kinds of therapies? So knowing what to ask for um, is half the battle. So you can ask for these therapies by name. When you're talking to therapists, you might want to work with EMDR International has a find an EMDR therapist function. Psychology Today has a trauma and PTSD search filter. You can also use your insurance. If you find a therapist that isn't covered by your insurance, you can use the CFRI counseling support program and get six sessions covered for free so <laughs> the, the <laughs> right yes so my main the thing the thing I hope you take away from all this is that you can heal that medical traumatic stress is treatable and it doesn't have to control your life you can and you can get better and I'm living proof of that so thank you